Amen. All right. Well, a while back, there was this opening at the CIA. Okay, now check this out. And they were looking for an assassin. I guess jobs are tough to get by, but anyway, so anyway, so, so these highly classified positions are obviously extremely difficult to fill. They're requiring these extensive background checks, and there's all this training, and there's this testing uh, before the candidates can even be considered for the position, okay? And so after reviewing several of the applicants and completing the checks and the training, the field was narrowed down to three people, okay, the most promising candidates, okay? Uh, one was actually a female, believe it or not, and two of them were males, Okay? And so the CIA officials began to administer the test and they took the, the first male candidate down this corridor and he closed the door and he handed him a gun and he said this. He said, we must be completely assured that you will complete your assignment and follow instructions regardless of the circumstances. Now inside this room, you're going to find your wife seated in a chair, take this gun and take her out. So the man, he was completely shocked. He says, you can't be serious. He said, I, I can never kill my wife. And the CIA man says, well, then you're obviously not the man for the job. So take your wife and go home. So they move on to the second guy and the second candidate. They repeat the same instruction drawn. And this man, he took the gun. He walked into the room and he actually closed the door. But after about five minutes of silence, the door opened and the man handed the CIA official the gun. And he says, I, I, just, I just couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't kill my wife. I, I, I tried to pull the trigger, but I just couldn't. And the CIA man says, well, then you're obviously not the man for the job either. Take your wife and you go home too. And so finally they decided to bring in the woman and they led her down the corridor and they closed the door and handed her the gun and said the same thing. We've got to be completely assured that you will complete your assignments, follow instructions regardless of the circumstances. Now inside this room you're going to find your husband seated in a chair, so take this gun and take him out. So the woman, she takes the gun, she walks into the room and before the door even closed all the way, the CIA officials heard the gun start firing. One shot after another for a total of 13 shots. And then it got really crazy. For the next several minutes, uh, the men heard yelling and screaming and furniture crashing and banging on the walls. And all of a sudden, silence. And, and then the door opened slowly and there stood the woman. And all of a sudden, she, she wipes the sweat from her brow and she says, You guys didn't tell me the gun was loaded with blanks. I had to beat him to death, to death with a chair. <laughs> now, why are you even laughing at that? <laughs> Hopefully the point with that is, how many guys are say that lady's behavior is a little surprising? Hello? Okay, I mean, you get married, you're just married for life. You're supposed to be there for each other, not beat each other with a chair. Okay, and folks, I'm telling you in all seriousness, I, did you know that I found some behavior even more surprising than that? Okay, and these people too are married. They're married spiritually, if you will, to Jesus Christ. They're called Christians. Okay, and here's what's so surprising. Here's what they do. Get this. They actually consider spending time with God as if it were an interrogation treatment. And that somebody's got to beat him with a chair to do it. What? Can you believe that? Isn't that surprising for Christians? And so the point is this. How, how did it get that way? I mean, how in the world did it ever become an interrogation treatment procedure to spend time with God? And if you put in the context as a Christian, I mean, I would assume it didn't start off that way, did it? I mean, I would assume when we first got saved, man, we couldn't, we couldn't wait uh, to be with God. We, we couldn't wait to spend time with God and, 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 and love Him and cherish Him. I, we loved God. Remember that? And so this is the question. How did it get like this? Well, folks, we've been seeing in our study, what I've learned over the years uh, is personally this. It happens when we lose sight of what we really have in Jesus Christ, and that is a personal, loving, intimate relationship, a beautiful one, with who? God, the creator of the universe. And folks, I'm telling you, as Christians, you can be truly born again. But once you lose sight of that, I'm telling you, overnight, your once vibrant walk with Jesus Christ just turned into a dry, stale, stupid, boring, man-made religion called churchianity. Okay? As we saw before, it's not Christianity, not the real deal. It's churchianity. As we've been seeing, this is a horrible, wretched, infectious disease that's spreading across, I believe, in the American church today. It's rotten to the core. And once you become infected with this disease, usually the Christian will cry out one of two things. Number one, help, I'm a Christian and I can't grow up. Or help, I'm a Christian and I'm dead as a stump. Okay? You ever been there? All of a sudden it feels like God's a million miles away and you're not going anywhere spiritually. Guess what? Uh, God didn't move, you did. You got infected with this disease. Therefore, to stave off this disease, we're going to continue our study. That's right, renewing your faith, okay? Renewing your faith. And what we're doing is revisiting all the so-called basics of Christianity. Okay, this time we're doing it through a renewed set of eyes. 
And we're going to look at them again the way it's supposed to be looked upon. And that is through the eyes of a relationship. A relationship with the creator of the universe. Because that's the tagline, is it not? A, a non-Christian will come up to us and they'll say, well, I don't understand this Christian religion. And what do we say? Oh, Christianity is not a religion. It's a But do we treat it that way? That's why they get the impression it's just another religion. Now, last time if you were here, we saw the first basic thing that we need to get renewed, uh, and that is our prayer life, okay? And what we just saw there was in, in, in uh, light of God's omnipresence and how huge and immense he is, is the reason why we should pray. And what we saw is the reason why we should pray is because when you put in the context of who God is and how big he is and he's above and beyond the universe, who in the world wouldn't want to? Give me a break. I mean, when we pray to God, when we talk to him, who are we talking to? This isn't some rock star. This isn't the president. This is God. This is the creator of the universe. And he wants to hear from me and you. Who wants to hurry that up? Why would you have to have your arm twisted on that one? Are you crazy? This is God. That's why we pray. Now, when you keep that in mind, it gets rid of that churchianity disease. It gets back to being a relationship like it's supposed to be. Okay, but that's not all. The second reason why uh, we pray okay, that we need to renew is we saw, okay, why do we pray? Well, let's break it down again even further. All right, what is prayer? We know why, because who in the world wouldn't want to? Give me a break, this is God. Okay, but what is it exactly? Well, once again, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's. Uh, we're gonna take a look at what Jesus has to say on this topic. Luke chapter six. Luke chapter six is our opening text, if you'd like to turn there. Luke chapter six. And uh, if you find Luke chapter six, what do you do? Moo and then go to verse 12 or go to verse 12 then moo if whatever you'd like to do just get there. Uh, Luke chapter 6 uh, let's take a look at verse 12. Now what we're going to see is you turn there in the context of what's going on here Jesus is going to be engaged in a certain behavior pay attention to that okay right before he does two really important things and I think the behavior he's engaged in kind of affects that and that's what we're going to see in the context. Luke chapter 6, let's take a look at verse 12. Here's what it says. Now, one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to go camping and eat burnt hot dogs and marshmallows and... No, that's not what he's doing there. What's he doing there? He's going to pray. And listen to this. He didn't just pray. He spent the night praying to God. What? Wow. Now, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them who he also designated apostles. There was Simon who was named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon who was called Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and of course Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Now, number two, he went down with them and he stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there and there was a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and, and, and from the coast of Tyre and Siren who had come to hear him, Jesus, and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits, demons, were cured and the people all, who tried, uh, all tried to touch him. Why? Because power was coming from him and healing them all. All of them. Okay? And here's what I see going on in the context. I think it's pretty obvious right before, if you put it in the context, before Jesus was making a very important decision, i.e. the choosing of his 12 disciples, apostles, what was he doing? What was he doing the night before? Okay, he was praying, obviously. And he wasn't just praying. He was praying how long? He was praying all night long. Now, notice the side effect. He obviously not only picked his disciples, which was very important, okay, decision to make, okay, but it says right there, he was so infused with power that he was healing all the people of the diseases and the demons were fleeing just, phew, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Okay? And here's the point, folks. Let's be honest. How many of us have ever done that? How many of us has actually done what Jesus did here, and that is not just pray, but pray the whole night to God? Well, that's those things that those prayer warriors do, you, right? Not me. No, I don't see it's just for a select few. And if we're honest with ourselves this morning, I mean, man, that sounds, that sounds impossible. Praying all night long? Are you kidding me? Now, I think it would uh, sound impossible if you're suffering from churchianity, but not if you understand what true prayer really is. Prayer, folks, comes from a couple different Greek words. One is ukamai and the other one's desis. Let's say that. That's awesome. Next two cats you get, name them that. You'll never forget. Okay, your neighbors might look at you weird, but hey, praise God, you're a Christian. Okay, ukamai and desis, and what it literally means is this. You put them together, it means this, to pray or ask for, to call to one's aid. I want to break it down even simpler than that because you got to get the context of what prayer is because it's so clouded today. Okay, prayer is simply communication with God. Turn to somebody and say that. 
Uh, all right, most of you got it, okay? It's communication with God. That's it, folks. Nothing more, nothing less, okay? You're just, listen, listen, this is all it is because we make it some mystical, magical thing that only super-duper spiritual people can do. Prayer is just talking to God. You're letting Him know your likes, your dislikes, your needs, etc. You're doing it anytime you want, anywhere. Praise God, as we saw last week with His omnipresence. He's with us wherever we go. You're doing it in high times. You're doing it in low times. Whatever time. You're just talking to God. Just listen. Here's the concept. Just like in a normal conversation, except it's God. It's from the heart. Okay? That's it. Okay? Now, this is the problem. This is where the churchianity stuff kicks in. The disease. Okay? For some reason, we think that prayer is just something, again, mysterious. Something that only those super spiritual people can do. Who, when they get up in the pulpit, they put their fingers in this weird position. They act like they're sucking on a lifesaver with a circle and squint one eye. And they go, Lord, Lord, I tell you. And as a brand new Christian, you don't know about anything about prayer, right? And so you look at these folks and you go, I guess that's how you're supposed to do it. Next thing you know, everybody's going, oh, yeah. And it becomes this religious thing. It's crazy, folks. And we laugh at it because it's so true. Okay, we think it's something that only super duper spiritual people can do. And, and that's only after years and years of practice. But folks, that's not what, I don't see Jesus doing that here. I don't see him following the list or form. He was just opening his heart. He was praying to God all night long. He communicated to the Father, expressing his desires, his thoughts, I'm sure. And in a nutshell, again, that's all prayer is. You're just communicating with God. It's a normal heartfelt Heartfelt conversation, just like you would have with a friend, a family member, whoever, okay, except again, your audience is God. It's not that hard to figure out. Anybody can do it, believe it or not, okay? You don't, you don't even have to buy a book on it. You don't even have to go to a prayer conference. You ever gone to a prayer and fasting conference that says meals included? <laughs> Missing the point. Missing the point, Okay. I'm telling you, let me demonstrate how easy it is. Anybody can pray, okay? Now, uh, how many guys, it's going to be tough, so pay attention. How many guys can talk? Okay. Now, you men who just looked at your husbands <laughs> or wives, <laughs> you're going to be talking on the way home, all right? Uh, but anyway, that's a different story. Okay, we can all talk, right? Okay, guess what? You can pray. I'm telling you, it's that simple. You can pray. You know how to pray. You can talk, you can pray. And as far as staying up all night long, oh, the seemingly impossible, only the spiritual people can do that. Really? You, uh, it's just communicate. How many of you guys have ever stayed up most of the night or into the wee hours of the morning of somebody that you haven't seen in a while? A good friend or a family member, right? It's just natural, right? And you just, time slipped away as you what? I went through this rehearsal thing. I had to step by step write down what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's just a normal conversation. It's the same thing with God. So guess what? If you've ever done that or you realize, hey, I could do that. Guess what? You, just like with Jesus, can pray all night long to God. It's not that hard. It's not that mysterious. You have the same ability. But it goes even a step further. Listen to this. You and I can communicate not only all night long with God, if we so choose in a normal heartfelt conversation, but did you know we can pray or communicate with God whenever, wherever we go on a constant basis? In fact, that's exactly what I believe the Apostle Paul is saying we should do, okay? Because it's a way of life. It's a relationship. And the simple text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says what? Pray when it's convenient. Pray after you went to that prayer and fasting conference with meals included. And now you're spiritual. Pray after you buy all that. No, he doesn't just say pray. He says how long? Continually, okay? And again, let's be honest. This is another passage on prayer that we go, man, this is impossible. I mean, first it's all night long and, and now you're saying all along. I mean, nonstop, all the time, continue. How do you do that? You got to work. You got to go places. Well, again, folks, if you keep in mind what prayer really is, it's simple, Prayer is communication with God. Whenever, where we go, just like in a normal conversation. So that means, listen, here's a neat concept. Did you know when I'm at home, I can talk with God? <laughs> Did you know it doesn't have to just be here? What a neat concept. Isn't that awesome? It's just Christianity stuff gets better and better. Did you know that uh, when I'm driving down the road, <laughs> I can talk to God? Isn't that cool? Right? 
Hey, how many of you guys be honest? Is a Christian when you pray in the car? Hey, it's really easy today because back in the day before Bluetooth, people thought you were thinking they're going to think you're crazy. But now you're going, oh, they think I'm talking on the cell phone. <laughs> yeah, I know you're out there. You just don't want to admit it. Okay, but you don't need to be ashamed. You can talk to God at home. You can talk to him uh, when you're driving down the, uh, the road in the car. Uh, wait a second, but not work. Yes, at work. You ever say anything to anybody at work? Uh, do you think God's just, well, he's at work. Ooh, there's a force field around it. He can't get through to me. <laughs> he's with us wherever we go. You can pray to God at home, uh, driving in the car, at work. Listen, you can pray to God. Listen, and who is the audience? It's God. I not only can talk to God, the creator of the universe, I can talk to him anytime, anywhere I am, at all time. That's what Paul's talking about continually. He's continually with you wherever you go. In the natural course of the day, you just communicate. Highs, lows, whatever, high, high you know, a concern, a, a like, a joy, anything. Just like in a normal conversation. It's not forced, it's not phony, it's spontaneous throughout the day, Okay. That's what he's talking about there. And you understand that, you get away from this churchianity stuff. That's praying continually, okay? It's not magical, it's not mystical, you don't need a book on it. That's what prayer is. And again, when you keep it in mind with that context of what prayer is, normal, heartfelt, conversation with God, anywhere, whenever you want, it starts to bring in mind and open up other passages of scriptures on prayer that you might have wondered about. And one of them is usually this. Sometimes I'll get this question from Christians. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8. Do not be like them. The context there, i.e. like the pagans. Don't pray like those guys. We'll get to that in a little bit. We saw this last week. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now how many guys, inquiring minds, want to know, let's be honest. How many guys have ever asked yourself the question as a Christian, if you read that text, you say, wait a second. If God already knows what I need before I even ask him, then why do I need to pray to him? Bingo. Stop getting in my notes. We'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's hard to understand if you're suffering from churchianity, but it's easy if you understand true Christianity in the eyes of a relationship. It's a normal relationship. And so here's the point. Why do I need to pray to God if he already knows what I uh, need before I even ask him? Because communication as we all know, is needed for a healthy relationship. Just like in any relationship. And that's what we have with God. Okay, for instance, how many guys would feel uh, if your spouse uh, did this to you? Check it out. There's this husband and wife, and they recently had this huge argument. And they ended up, unfortunately, not talking to each other for, for days. Okay, and so finally on the third day, the husband asked where one of his shirts was. And the wife says, oh, oh. So now you're talking to me. And so the husband, he's confused and, you know, it's a guy thing. And he says, well, what are you talking about? And his wife challenged him and says, well, haven't you noticed I haven't been speaking to you for three days? And the husband replied, no, I just thought we were getting along. <laughs> right? Now, husbands, you already just sit, just look straight ahead, man. Don't laugh too much like Bobby. He's already in big trouble. Right? But we play the silent treatment with each other once in a while, right? And we saw in our marriage study, we went through 12 weeks, the previous study, hello. Uh, that's not a good thing to do, right? You need healthy communication for a healthy uh, relationship, okay? Uh, but here's the point. Uh, did you know that the silent treatment is not only not good for your earthly marriage? Did you know it's not good at all for your spiritual marriage, if you will, with God? Do you like the silent treatment from your spouse? Does it help your marriage? then it's the same thing, folks, in the silent treatment in our uh, lack of communication with God. I don't have time to pray. I can't pray. I don't know when the last time I pray. Excuse me. Why would you give God the silent treatment when he's there wherever you go? That is what is going on, okay? If your spouse rarely, if ever, talked to you, that kind of make you feel a little bit horrible, wouldn't it? Remember, we have a relationship. Here's the, here's the bombshell then how does it make God feel when we do that to him? We're his children. He loves us. The church is the bride of Christ. He loves us. He wants to talk to us, but we just walk around. Wow. See, when you really see prayer for what it is, a normal conversation in a normal relationship, everything starts coming together, doesn't it? Let's take it a step further. What if my wife considered it a duty? To spend time with me. 
I mean, what if I actually heard from my wife sarcastically say in front of me, oh boy, I got to spend time with him again? I mean, it was just like last night. We were getting along great. No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but seriously, what if I, she didn't just, it was like a duty, a drudgery, right? But I actually heard her voice. Oh man, I got to spend time with him. I mean, if that really happened, and that happened to you, and that was your spouse, how would you feel? Horrible. Then how does it make God feel when we not only give him the silent treatment, but we actually do voice that? Oh, you got to pray. Let's talk to God. Huh? Why do we pray to God even though he already knows uh, uh, everything? Hello. Because it's all part of a normal, healthy relationship. And you need conversation, communication for a healthy relationship. And I'm telling you folks, when we get back to not just why do we pray, because who wouldn't want to, but what prayer really is and how simplistic it is. And we've made it so messed up, have we not, in the church? <sighs> Churchianity, that disease goes right out the window. Amen? Okay, the third one, the final question we're going to talk about pray to renew our prayer life uh, is, all right, then let's break it down. How do we do it? Common sense, right? Why do we do it? What is it? Now, how do we do it? Okay, once again, let's go back to our opening text that we saw last week from Jesus. Okay, and then we're going to start shredding it apart. Lots going on in this text. Let's take a look. Matthew 6, verse 5 through 13, Jesus speaking now, when you pray, not if, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth. They've received their reward in full. Don't do that. Number two. And when you pray, not if, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. It's personal. It's between you and him. It's a private relationship. Who is unseen. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, number three, not if, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they're going to be heard because there are many words. Oh, no, no. And don't be like him, he says. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So this then is how you should pray. And he simply says this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay? Now, if you were here last week, we saw this was our opening text. And Jesus here not only assumed we would be praying with the phrase when, not if, but he also told us how to pray effectively, intimately, and personally with God. Unlike the bad examples, the hypocrites, and the pagans, okay? So that's what we're going to do to finish out this part. We're going to take a look at how we're supposed to pray by looking at how Jesus said not to pray. And I believe in this text, the first way he says not to pray is using a bunch of flowery words. Flowery words. And you have to say it like that, Tom. Right? And a really rotten, rich impersonation. Okay? Gets the point across. Now, to help illustrate that better than my British impersonation uh, of doing this and the foolishness of flowery words in our personal relationship with God, we're going to look at it through the eyes of another personal relationship, a marriage, and that's the marriage of Paul and Janet Lush. Give it up for Paul and Janet Lush. And uh, as they get up here, what they're going to do is they're going to hopefully illustrate for us in their relationship, marriage, okay, and uh, they're going to illustrate for us some behavior, some things that you probably don't want to do in your relationship with God as we get you guys all mic'd up there. And we're going to take a look at some different scenarios. And uh, hopefully we got some sound there. How are we doing there? Is that guy on? Hello. We got one. One's live. No, I don't think so. There he is. He's live. It is, is it there? Yes, you're there. Attention right. came out sharper, so okay. okay. <laughs> and what we're going to do is uh, Paul here is going to communicate with Janet, and he's going to try out this uh, first example of what not to do. Uh, he's going to come home from wherever, and he's going to speak to Janet with some flowery words. Let's see how well it goes over with her. Oh, Janet, I careth for you. Thou artest the coolest wifeth I could ever have. Thee thou, thou thine, though... Or, no, no, not that. Hail, Janeth, full of grace. Wife of Paul, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among wives, and blessed is the fruit of thy kitchen, especially your jam and lasagna. <laughs> yeah! You love that, huh? Now, as you guys can tell with Janeth's look there, she was just warming up to that mode of conversation, wasn't she? No, she's about ready to slap him, right? Okay, in love, of course. Okay, but the whole point is, that was, that's kind of goofy, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine if he actually came home and that's how he addressed her? Oh, dry, dry, dry. Right? Right? Can you imagine that? I mean, for real. Right? Here, here's the bombshell. 
Why do we do that to God then? Back to the, oh Lord, oh and the. Now listen, I, I have no problem with that. If that's really how you speak, maybe 500 years ago. Maybe you got in a time warp and you got stuck here and okay, I'll work with you. We don't speak like that. Why are we doing that to God? Right? Okay, now, now listen, it, no, it was goofy. Jesus said, don't do that. This is, let's start ripping apart this text. Here's what he says here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, don't be like the who? Hypocrites. Why? Because these people, how they pray, it's wrong. They pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. In other words, it's just a big show to impress people. Oh, no. oh, no. oh look how spiritual I am. Oh. Jesus said, hey, that's all you want is praises of men. You just got it. But that's not a relationship with me. Stop using flowery words, Jesus says. Why? Because that's not prayer to God. You don't talk to that way to your spouse in that relationship. Why are we talking like that to God in that relationship? You see what he's saying there? Wanted to break it down for you. Now, we're going to continue on. The second way, according to this passage, Jesus says not to pray, okay, is a marathon of words. Okay, a marathon of words. Okay, so what if, once again, here comes Paul. He's coming home from wherever. And this time he speaks to his wife, Janet, like this. Oh, hi, Janet. I'm glad you're here. It's great to see you. I just wanted to let you know that you're the most incredible woman in the world. And I can never think of living a day without you. Oh, what's for supper, lasagna? Yeah, look at Man, that's awesome. And once again, as you can tell with Janet's look, she's really getting into this. And shaking of the head means no. Okay. But again, that was kind of goofy. Okay. I mean, and, and you know, so Paul, what's he doing? Obviously, the impression is he's just trying to get it done with. You know what I'm saying? Just get it out as fast as he can. Get it out of whatever. And then hopefully scoot by or maybe go watch some TV or something. Just get it over with. Just fast, fast. Fast as you can go, right? Get over with. Come on, quick, quick, quick. We can chop, chop. Time to stuff to do. You know where I'm going with this. Why do we do that with God? I mean, we're talking to God, the creator of the universe. And we, we get, okay, I got to pray. First of all, that's wrong. But then it's just as fast as we can, get it over with. I got stuff to do. And then somehow we punch in our spiritual time clock. Yeah, God loves me. And praise God, he does love us. But listen, if, if Paul really spoke only that way to Janet, cramming in as many words in the shortest amount of time just to get it over with, what's he saying to her? He's saying, you're not important enough to spend quality time with. And I just want to get this thing over with. We're not supposed to do that with God. In fact, again, Jesus said, don't do this. That's a bad example. Here's what he says now in this text, Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the who? Pagans. Babbling on, on, on Because they think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Jesus said, if you're going to pray to God, what a privilege that is in the first place. But the last thing you want to do is just to get it over with as fast as you can. Babble on, 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 on some mindless thing. Just get it over with. Get, I like what one guy said. Did you listen to this? This is convicting. He said, mindless prayer is offensive to God. Wow, that cuts to the quick, doesn't it? Mindless prayer is offensive to God. Why? Well, when you look at it through the eyes of a relationship, remember, it's supposed to be that. How would Janet feel if, again, that's the only way that Paul communicated to her? Just as fashion go. He, in fact, he, he's, he's doing the same routine over and over again. Just quick to get it over with. Nothing new. Nothing spontaneous. Nothing from the heart. And then he walked around her and just went about his business. Do you think she'd find that offensive? Mindless prayer is offensive to God. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't be like them. The third way that we don't pray to God is a list or a formula of words. Okay? You're following a script. Okay? Uh, for instance, what if Paul were to come home? And uh, this time he was to uh, speak to Janet this way. All right, let's take a look at it. I got to do this right. Oh, Janet, I adore you. You're the greatest wife in the world. Okay, step two. <laughs> oh, Janet, I confess that I'm unworthy as a husband. How could you ever care for me is beyond my comprehension. Oh, yeah, step three. Hmm. Oh, Janet, I thank you for... All that you've done for me and for being the best wife ever. Step four. Step four. Oh, Janet, I humbly ask that you provide me a morsel of food and, and stuff like that. How about, how about lasagna? <laughs> yeah. 
Do it for the Paul and Janice show. All righty. Huh? Isn't that awesome? Doesn't it make your heart feel so warm when your spouse comes to you with a speech that's rehearsed? Uh, yeah, no, nah, it doesn't work, okay? Uh, especially when Jesus taught us to pray like this. I hope to open your eyes on this passage. I'll never forget the first time uh, it was opened my eyes. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Jesus said, now here's how you're supposed to do it. Okay? He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, now here's the point I want to bring up on this passage. Has anybody ever noticed the length of that prayer? Stop and think about that. The length of that prayer when Jesus said, not just what the prayer is and what it contains, but the length of that prayer. It's not that long, right? It's just a couple of verses. It's short, straight to the point, all about God, personal, intimate, right? Okay, that's what it is. Now, here's what I've noticed. How funny it is, Jesus finally tells us, here's the bad examples. Now, here's how you're supposed to do it. And he just, it's a short prayer, straight to the point, from the heart, between us and God. And then we take that short, straight prayer from Jesus, and we turn it around into this giant, lengthy formula, and that becomes the only way we can now pray to God. And it becomes something perfunctory and just like, okay, step one, step two. Oh, no, I skipped a step. Oh, I got to start all over. Do we do that in our normal conversation? Hey, if that's a good starting point for you to learn some of the art, if you will, of prayer, that's fine. But at some point, shouldn't you put the formula down and start speaking from the heart like it's a relationship? Okay. And uh, one more to go. Uh, the fourth way we don't pray to God is a last resort of words. Okay, a last resort of words. Okay, for instance, what if Paul were to uh, have a day like this? He starts the day off. He's going to end the day, wrap it up. But how, if this was his day and how he communicated with Janet went something like this. Let's take a look. Okay, move down. Good morning. Good morning, honey. Here's your coffee. I know you need that really badly. Well, good morning to you too. Honey, don't forget what you have to do today. The gas tank is empty. You need to, you need to get the gas in the car. Because we're going out tomorrow to KFC. So, please. Okay, bye now. Good talking to you. Hi, honey. So good to have you home. It's been lonely not talking to anyone. So how did your day go? Everything go okay? Oh, excuse me. I'll get out of your way. Yeah, okay. I'm glad everything went well today. Do you have laryngitis? Oh, getting tired. Oh. Okay, honey. Um, I guess you're... I guess you're all tired out now, calling it a night, huh? Oh, oh uh, get, get gas, because tomorrow we have to go to KFC and pick up Pastor Billy and take him to d dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether to clap on that or not. <laughs> oh, wow. Can you believe that? You guys had me fooled. I was digging that cow cup right there, then you... I'm putting this on tape. I didn't script the KFC part, so that was uh, unfortunate. But anyway, here's the whole point, folks. Uh, can you imagine if Paul did that all day long, all, from the time he got up to the time he got to bed? He literally just ignored Janet, even though she was right there the whole time, wherever he went, trying to communicate with them. Yeah, give him another hand. All right? And then almost as an afterthought, right before he went to sleep, it's like, oh, oh, yeah, like I almost forgot something. I, uh, <clears throat> okay, you know where I'm going. Why do we do that to God? This isn't the president. This isn't some rock star. This is the creator of the universe who sent his son to die on the cross for us so we can have this beautiful, loving, intimate relationship. I could speak with him whenever, wherever I go. He's with me wherever I go, even at work, even in the car. And then... I don't talk to him all morning, all day, 
all night. I got plenty of time for other things. And then almost as an afterthought, oh yeah, I need to pray. Dear God, I got to... Now what's wild is he tells us this. In James chapter 4, God makes us this wonderful promise. Chapter, uh, verse 8, he says, draw near to God, James says. And what's God going to do? He's going to draw near to us. And yet the irony is, folks, that we don't have the time of day for God. I, it sounds like we've forgotten what prayer really is. And how we do it. Through the eyes of relationship, it makes it pretty simple. Okay, and, and so here's the point. Uh, it, folks, it's high time that you and I in the church, listen, our, our, our words might be appropriate, but the mode of which, the communication that we share, oftentimes, if we're honest, over the years or however long it takes, it's become shallow, it's become impersonal, it's become repetitive, it's become just a, a ritual, a formula, a mindless activity, boring, and we wonder why prayer is so boring. We've made it that way by turning it into a religion called churchianity. So I don't know about you, but as we close, I think it's time we get back to the real deal, an intimate form of prayer communication from the heart. It's almost like we need to get back to being little kids again and just express what we need from our heart. We're going to close with this video, and I just want to challenge you. When was the last time as a born-again Christian you prayed heartfelt, innocently, spontaneously to God like this? Let's take a look.
That's what I wanted you to get. Ends on the famous response in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. When was the last time we prayed like that? Like little kids. Spontaneous from the heart. And I got to thinking, maybe that's why revival's not coming to our nation at this time. Maybe it's not just a lack of prayer. Or we're praying. But what kind of prayer is it? Maybe it's a lack of personal prayer from the heart. Passionate. Like those kids. Oh, that we would become little children again and renew our prayer life to Jesus. I think we would not only see a revival in our heart, but it would spread across our nation. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today, that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. The Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one, says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay, that's called lying. Okay, and if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay, okay. The, the, another commandment says, you shall not steal, okay? Uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right, and it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain, And how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly, the Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says, if you even look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. And finally, the Bible says, uh, you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? Well, again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder. The only difference is you pulled the trigger, if you will, in your heart. You wish they were dead. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing in principle. Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. And that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. For instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime, 
uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel, and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, they certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime, okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you of your sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.